Hey guys, welcome to my latest video on active recovery methods and how and why we should be using some form of active recovery in our training programs in the pursuit of optimal performance. Now throughout this video what we really need to consider is the direct effect that recovery has on our body's ability to perform. Generally as athletes we are pretty good at kind of training hard, pushing ourselves, but what we're sometimes not so good at is understanding and appreciating that although training is obviously very important, allowing the body to recover and adapt from that training is equally important if we want the benefits of that training to actually be seen and manifested in the body over time. Stress plus recovery is what equals adaptation. Active recovery methods can be used to kind of boost our body's natural ability to heal, but it is worth bearing in mind that the effect sizes of most of these interventions is pretty small and will ultimately only help your recovery by a very small percentage compared to just passively resting alone. Most of our body's recovery capacity is defined by broader lifestyle factors. So the best three things which you can do to ensure that your body is going to be recovering optimally is to get enough sleep, manage your weekly training volume and to eat a good quality diet. Sleep is the single most regenerative thing which you can do for your body and mind and getting a good amount of sleep consistently night by night is an absolute non-negotiable for any serious athlete. When you don't get enough sleep you're obviously going to be tired but you're also going to become physically impaired and cognitively impaired which means that you're not going to have as much energy to train properly. You're less likely to make good decisions which could mean that you become more likely to get injured you're less likely to make good choices in terms of diet and nutrition and all of these things are going to affect your body's ability to repair itself. Somewhere between seven and a half to eight and a half hours of sleep per night is kind of a commonly cited target or average recommendation but the actual amount which is kind of optimal for each person is very variable and is very individual to you. When you are trying to figure out how much sleep is the right amount for you, it is worth considering that the more physically active you are, chances are the more sleep you are actually going to need. Try not to see sleeping more as laziness, try to see it as necessary payment for your body to be able to cope with the day-to-day -day demands which you expect from it. If you are unsure of whether you're getting the right amount of sleep or not, consider the following three things. How kind of tired are you generally throughout a normal day? How reliant are you on caffeine or other stimulants to get yourself through a normal day? And how often do you wake up by an external stimulus, such as an alarm clock? If you find that throughout a normal day you are generally pretty tired, or if you need caffeine or other stimulants to get yourself through all of the activities which you want to get done during the day, then chances are you are, to at least some degree, slightly sleep deprived. And again, if you are more often than not woken up by an alarm clock rather than waking up naturally, then you could be slightly sleep deprived as well. When you're woken up by an external stimulus, it means that your body is more likely to become woken up uh, midway through a sleeping cycle, which will leave you kind of feeling groggy and drowsy. When your body wakes up naturally, it will wait until the end of a sleep cycle, which should hopefully leave you feeling a little bit more energetic for your day. Now, in modern society, it can be pretty difficult to not be reliant on alarm clock, especially if you're somebody who has to be up early most mornings, but try to go to bed the previous night early enough that you actually wake up just before your alarm goes off. Next, let's discuss the importance of managing your total training volume. Training more is generally a good thing up to a point, but everybody will have that upper threshold, which is the maximum amount of training volume which their body will be able to kind of physically cope with. Now, if we go above that um, upper ceiling and we train more than our body is able to cope with, we're gonna get accumulated fatigue. We're gonna become gradually more and more tired, less strong, less fast, less powerful. We're gonna become more likely to pick up injuries. And in extreme circumstances, we might even start to show some symptoms of overtraining syndrome. Much like with sleep, the optimal amount of training for you to do is pretty variable from person to person, but it is largely dependent on a few fairly predictable factors. So it is influenced quite a lot by your age, uh, your training history and your genetics. So if you are somebody who has been doing 
a large weekly volume every week for many, many years, your body's going to be more well adapted and more able to cope with a highly stressful taxing training program than somebody who isn't. And unfortunately, regardless of your genetics and regardless of how much training you've done in the past, your body's natural ability to tolerate exercise will start to steadily decline over time once you get to your kind of late teens, early 20s and onwards. Working to a weekly training volume which is challenging but sustainable week on week is generally going to be the right thing to do to get the best results over time. And on top of this, factoring in lighter training weeks or deloads roughly every four to eight weeks depending on your programme just to allow the body to recover and replenish itself that extra little bit more before pushing hard for the next training cycle. Diet and nutrition is also hugely important for your body's recovery capacity, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail in this video because I've already got videos on both of my channels about diet, nutrition, and supplementation. So I will link those videos in the description of this one and I will link them at the end of this video so you can follow those links to find out more. If your sleep, your training and your diet are all on point, then chances are that your body's recovery capacity is already at kind of 90 to 95% of its absolute maximum already. For those of you who really want to push your body's recovery capacity towards its absolute maximal potential and get that last 5 to 10%, that is where these active recovery methods can come into play. There are lots of weird and wonderful techniques out there which can be used to um, heal and rejuvenate your body, but in the interest of brevity and relevance, I will only be covering the ones in this video which I think are the most helpful, the most accessible to most people and the least expensive. Deep tissue work and massage, uh, compression clothing and icing. Before fully understanding how these active recovery methods can help us, we need to at least have a basic understanding of how the body responds and reacts to intense exercise. When we exercise, harmful chemicals called free radicals are produced. Now when the exercise is particularly heavy or intense, these free radicals can obviously accumulate in really high concentrations inside the active muscle. When free radicals are particularly abundant in one specific area, they can actually cause damage to the muscle cell itself. Now when the muscle cell membrane becomes damaged, it becomes leaky, and some of the stuff which is normally inside the cell leaks out into the interstitial space outside. This damage is detected by the body and in response immune cells are sent to flood the area to initiate that healing response. But this sudden movement of lots of different white blood cells and immune cells to this local area also causes um, swelling and inflammation in the area. Now this swelling and inflammation actually causes the nerve endings inside of the muscle to become a little bit more sensitive and a little bit more excitable, which means that they are constantly being stimulated, which the brain perceives as pain, and this is the actual reason for delayed onset muscle soreness. Now, one of the main ways in which active recovery methods actually work is by forcing these post-exercise metabolites out of the local area into the lymphatic system to be drained away and back into circulation. Moving those immune cells away from the local area obviously reduces the swelling, reduces the inflammation and reduces the pain signals, which means that we become less sore. Now in the case of massage, compression clothing and deep tissue work, these methods work by physically pushing chemicals away from the local area, whereas in the case of icing, the cold causes local vasoconstriction which means there's less blood flow to the area, which means that immune cells can't get there as easily. Anybody who chooses to engage in some form of active recovery will hopefully experience some sort of benefit. There are certain populations of people who might find active recovery to be even more beneficial and necessary than others. The main populations that will really benefit from using active recovery are adults, because children have already got this kind of natural ability to rejuvenate very quickly anyway. People who are doing high impact training, so if you are a runner or a weightlifter or a gymnast, you will probably have more need for active recovery than somebody who does a more gentle or a more technical sport. And finally, any athlete who is training three times per week or more. 
If you are only training once or twice a week, you probably won't have as much need for active recovery because your body will have plenty of time to passively rest between each training session anyway. Based on this information, I would suggest that if you are somebody who is 18 years or older, somebody who's doing a high impact stressful sport three times per week or more, then you should definitely look to include some form of active recovery in your training program. If you don't fit this description, you probably won't need to use active recovery on a regular basis, but it is something that you might choose to use from time to time if you are feeling particularly fatigued, sore or injured. Before we delve deep into the specific details of each individual recovery method, there is one last thing which we need to consider, and that is the optimal timing of when to implement these active recovery methods. How long after the end of a training session is the best amount of time to wait before utilising your active recovery. When we use active recovery, we want them to accelerate the healing of the body after exercise, but we don't want them to stop the muscles from getting damaged in the first place. So, although it might seem logical to recover immediately after the end of a training session, that might actually not be the most optimal way to do it. Because if we recover straight away, we might be interrupting the body's natural response to that exercise, which might mean that we get less adaptation from it. On the other end of that scale, we don't want to wait too late before we use our recovery, because if the body is already almost entirely naturally healed before we actually do it, then we might have missed the perfect moment where that act of recovery might have had the most effect on accelerating the whole process. As a rough guideline, I would say that between 3 and 24 hours after the end of a heavy training session would be the perfect window of opportunity to use your active recovery. Let's start by discussing sports massage and deep tissue work. Although they're pretty similar, deep tissue work obviously has the benefit of you can do it to yourself whenever you want to, whereas you might not have unlimited access to a trained sports therapist to massage you. When you're doing deep tissue work on yourself, there are lots of different tools which you might choose to use, but my personal weapons of choice are a foam roller and a lacrosse ball. I use the foam roller for the larger muscle groups, like my back and my quads and my hamstrings, and then I use the lacrosse ball for smaller muscle groups, as well as going into more specific areas which are feeling particularly tight or sore. So during a deep tissue session, I would spend kind of 10 to 15 minutes just generally exploring all of the different muscle groups which are heavily involved in your training. And then once you've done that, try to pay attention to the areas which are feeling particularly sore or tight, and then just spend a little bit more time giving them the specific attention which they need. Next, we move on to compression clothing. Compression clothing works via the same mechanism as deep tissue and massage by squeezing and applying pressure to the muscles, but it's obviously a much milder version. Because this intervention is comparatively less intense, we need to wear the clothes for a decent length of time in order to get any observable benefit from them. About three hours is kind of the recommended minimum, but the more time you spend in them, the better. Sometimes when the weather is cold enough, I will actually sleep in my compression gear because they are comfortable enough to do so, and that ensures that I've kept them on for a decent length of time. We move on now to the final recovery method, which I'll be discussing in this video, which is icing. Icing can be further subdivided down into two separate protocols, which is spot icing and ice immersion. Spot icing works best when there is a very specific part of the body which is particularly sore or fatigued. General recommendations for spot icing is that the cold pack is not placed directly on the skin to avoid ice burns, but you have to make sure that the barrier between the ice pack and the skin is obviously not too thick because otherwise the skin won't get cold enough for you to actually gain any benefit from it. Icing for 10 minutes, or at least until the area has gone a little bit numb, is generally enough to produce a positive effect. Ice immersion is a little bit more useful for when your fatigue is a little bit more general and less localised. I keep a little bin clean, which I use for ice immersing individual limbs as and when they need them. And if the fatigue and soreness is even more general than that and is kind of spread over the whole body, that is when I will have a whole body ice bath. It's important that we get our ice bath to a good temperature and that we stay in the cold water for the right amount of time in order to get the most benefit from the intervention. If the water is not cold enough, then chances are it's not going to be enough of a stimulus to 
cool down the muscles and produce any significant change or benefit. Conversely, if the water is too cold, you're probably not going to be able to tolerate staying in there for long enough for the deeper muscles that are further away from the skin to actually be cooled down and affected. Research suggests that having the water at a temperature of roughly 10 to 15 degrees and staying in the water for 10 to 15 minutes seems to be a pretty good balance which produces the most optimal results. Generally speaking, taking an ice bath is very safe and is very effective. Despite this, I do want to give a small disclaimer for the potential risks. Now, if the water is particularly cold and if you stay in there for too long, there is a very slim chance that you could get hypothermia. But the main danger associated with cold water immersion actually comes from that initial shock of getting in. When your body experiences a rapid decrease in temperature, your heart rate has to accelerate very quickly in response to that. Now, a healthy person's heart will be able to cope with this quite easily, but if you are somebody with an underlying health condition which affects your heart, or your blood pressure, or your circulation, then this could potentially be a little bit more dangerous. It's up to you personally to weigh up the risk versus the reward of taking an ice bath, but generally speaking, if you are healthy enough to be undergoing intense exercise on a regular basis, then you are almost certainly going to be healthy enough to safely undergo cold water immersion. Guys, we have come to the end of today's video. Thank you so much for watching it. I hope that you found it useful and informative. Please do check out the videos which I've made in the past on diet and nutrition and supplementation if you would like to find out a bit more about those things specifically. And please consider um, pressing the like button on this video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you very much and I will see you in the next one.